Hello and welcome to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. The US economy grew by 6.4% in the first quarter, surpassing analysts' expectations thanks to reduced lockdown restrictions and a major fiscal stimulus program that gave a boost to consumer spending. Meanwhile, in a sign of an improving labour market, the latest weekly jobless claims hit the lowest level since before the pandemic over a year ago. So, can the US economy return to pre-pandemic levels by the end of the year? And what are some of the risks? Joining me to discuss is Daniel Lacau. He's the Chief Economist at Tresis. Daniel, great to chat to you. First and foremost, let's talk about the recent data. A lot of analysts have been taken aback by the strength of data in April. What's your assessment of the recent US economic data? Has it come in above your expectations? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I think that the data in the United States was, was pretty strong not above our expectations. We expected a, a quicker recovery of the job markets. Um, but in general, uh, if we look at, for example, both the manufacturing services, durable goods, and the GDP, obviously, figures have shown that the, that the recovery is certainly much stronger than the one of the Eurozone and uh, also much better than what was expected at uh, the end of last year. If you remember, uh, most of the consensus estimates moved around uh, a level of, of of recovery for the US economy of uh, about 4 or 5% for 2021. And it's going to be significantly above that, obviously aided by a giant combination of monetary and fiscal stimulus, um, which uh, creates a little bit of, of, of risk, particularly into 2022. But, uh, but the 2021 figure was going to show, in my opinion, that uh, the United States recovers all of the lost GDP of uh, 2020 by the next quarter, by the second quarter. So you mentioned the massive fiscal and monetary stimulus that we're uh, seeing at the moment. Obviously, stimulus checks from Washington are helping to drive consumer spending. Is this the main source of growth, do you think, in terms of the path to recovery? Uh, no, I don't think that it is the main source of growth. Uh, the stimulus checks, if you look at the data, uh, the growth in consumption compared with the size of the stimulus checks uh, is uh, significantly lower. So it shows that most uh, citizens in, in America, as, as one would imagine, are saving for a rainy day part of those checks. Uh, so I think not. I think that the, the recovery is entirely due to the successful vaccination rollout and the and the reopening of the uh, of the economy. I think that uh, we see, for example, how the services sector is coming back strongly. Uh, most of the job creation is in hospitality and leisure. Uh, you know, the, the, the reservations and uh, level of utilization of the hospitality sector have gone through the roof. So all of those factors show that the debacle the, the of the economy was due to the lockdowns and the uh, recovery is fundamentally due to the reopening. So some are saying that we could get back to pre-COVID levels by the end of the year. The IMF, however, says a full U.S. recovery won't happen until mid-2022. Where do you stand? No, I think that it's going to be much earlier. If we look at the annualized GDP growth of the first quarter of the United States, uh, basically, the United States would recover uh, entirely the, the, the GDP in the second quarter. So I think it's going to be much faster than those estimates. Uh, but it's but we should not be sort of uh, excessively complacent about that because GDP, as we all know, is is a very broad and very aggregated figure in which elevated government spending plays an important part. So um, we need to think about the quality of that recovery. And what I think is is more interesting is to look at, for example, the jobs market. Uh, labor participation rate remains at about 61.5%. Uh, unemployment still at around 6%. So I think that once we see unemployment go back to the 3.5% level, then we can say it's a full recovery. Um, and with labor participation rate closer to 63 or 65%. So we had some interesting comments from Janet Yellen this week. 
basically saying she was in favour of an interest rate rise in order to keep the stimulus-led growth under control. Then she sort of wound back her comments and said that she wasn't calling for an FOMC rate hike. What did you make of her comments and, and what does it mean about the picture for inflation? What's your view on price levels? Yeah, it shows basically that the the government and, uh, and, and the Federal Reserve are very short of tools to address the, the inflationary pressures that are pretty evident for the majority of, of Americans. No? We're seeing that food prices are going, fresh food prices are going up uh, significantly, uh, gas prices, gasoline prices for, for the UK listeners. Um, we're seeing how the the pinch of inflation is much uh, larger actually than official figures particularly for the least well off of the part of the population so all of that uh, is is showing that there's an evident concern about inflation and the problem is uh, that yet that Chairman Powell and, and Ms. Yellen are saying that the Fed has tools to address the rise in inflation. However, the only tool that the Fed has to address the rise in inflation would be hiking rates. And that would make, have a create ripple effects in the credit market. So I think that why why she backed out of that comment is because she knows that the, the that the fragile state of the credit market and the and the economy could be rocked by uh, an increase in interest rates hence the the federal reserve doesn't have any tool to address the rise in inflation they cannot stop the repurchase of assets because uh, then obviously uh, the, the 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 sovereign yields would start creeping up aggressively very soon, and they cannot hike rates because it would create a very aggressive credit crunch. So, so what Chairman Powell was mentioning is actually probably questioned, is that it seems that the Fed does not have any tools to address this rise in inflation. Well, that all sounds very concerning. I mean, how worried are you about a risk of a potential credit crunch? And if we do see inflation rear its ugly head, which clearly we're already seeing signs of through food prices, like you say, through the commodities market, as other asset prices as well, what is the implications of rising inflation and, and what could that mean for the economic recovery and markets? Mm -hmm. The rise in inflation is should be taken a lot more seriously than what consensus is, is taking it. We hear uh, too much of a complacency we see too much complacency in the uh, almost widespread uh, accepted um, argument that uh, inflation is 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 going to be transitory this this there's absolutely no evidence more importantly we don't know what transitory means we don't know if it's a year we don't know if it's two years what we do know is that we had protests all over the world in 2018, 2019, from Chile to uh, Spain, Germany, France, uh, about the rise uh, in the cost of living. We know that already before the COVID-19, and we know that the massive increase in uh, monetary stimulus that we saw in 2020 has uh, directed massive amounts, trillions of dollars of newly created money into obviously commodities because because it's uh, as, as assets and as liquid assets. Therefore, uh, unless central banks truly understand that they need to not moderate, but slash money supply growth, because it's not a, the, the recovery does not require massive money supply growth. Unless they do that, um, we're going to have much more important uh, risks of stagflation, i.e. that 2022, 2023, global GDP growth moderates, uh, developed economies grow at historical levels, but inflation is higher. Therefore, that is, and that is very negative for coming back to markets, for precisely the areas and the assets where we have seen a higher level of inflows. 
the so-called value assets, the sort of co-value sectors. Obviously, the, uh, the, uh, the, the companies that have the m largest problem in transferring to uh, prices, the input cost increases. So uh, we so they need to pay attention to inflation because the if if inflation uh, remains elevated and rises faster what we see is that markets react even if central banks say that they are going to continue to pursue the same policy we saw that before yields rise despite central banks saying that they're going to soldier on with their policy. We see that uh, markets sell off in the more cyclical stocks because people see that 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 uh, you know that the argument of transitory inflation makes no sense. No? Uh, inflation, we have to repeat all the time this because they're trying to find all types of excuses. Inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. And they need to understand that it's also there is also a monetary solution, and that the with the level of liquidity that are, that exists in the market today, there is absolutely no need to repurchase 120 billion a month in sovereign assets and mortgage-backed securities because there is ample demand to keep those uh, uh, to keep that supply well covered. So is there a risk that we could end up facing a similar situation to Japan in terms of its uh, lost decade and economic stagflation? Absolutely, we can. We're, we're repeating the same mistakes that Japan uh, committed in, 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 uh, after the, uh, the real estate bubble. Obviously, it's a different situation. This is due to a pandemic. But precisely because it is due to a pandemic, the idea that the response has to be the same but in larger quantities uh, that we saw after the 2008 crisis is, is incorrect, in my opinion. Is absolutely incorrect. the The entire economic debacle comes from the COVID nineteen spread and the lockdowns, and the entire economic recovery comes from the reopening and the vaccination. In the middle, the trillions of dollars of uh, asset purchases and the massive increase in current spending from governments is going to create lower growth, lower productivity growth, and higher debt in the future. And I think that uh, they need to understand that now I can understand that policymakers have worked sort of, uh, it's, the other day Judy Shelton mentioned this, this analogy, you know, she said they, they worked like an airbag in a car crash. But once mm. you've, you've uh, the, the airbag is out, you need to let the car continue. You need to let the car go. You cannot continue to drive with the airbag on, with the airbag open. So uh, the, the idea that they need to maintain these unprecedented levels of asset purchases, these completely uh, ridiculous rates, and the, the, this level of deficit spending, to me, makes no sense. So is this just because the Fed is concerned that it might spook markets? Because yeah. we've already seen from the Bank of Canada that they've started to taper their bond purchase, but no signal um, from the Fed. And it seems as though they keep keeping interest rates and their bond purchases as is uh, for a while now. So is this just because they're scared about markets? Absolutely, it is. It is very evident that uh, uh, the actions of the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank are entirely uh, oriented towards uh, market and market value and, and market prices. Because think about this, the European Central Bank would have not taken such an aggressive and immediate action and unnecessary action just due to a very modest rise in yields that still left sovereign issuers with negative real and nominal yields in most cases. So it shows that it's not just because of uh, the risks in the macroeconomic environment. It is fundamentally because they see that if sovereign yields go up, even if it's modestly, it can create ripple effects in markets, and a market crash would generate uh, a significant risk to the overall economy. But I disagree 
entirely with that proposition. There is a, a, a small move in markets. What everybody understands that is a, that is a logical, even healthy correction, is would be precisely the indication that um, there is that the next phase for markets would be coming from the reality of growth, not from the uh, artificial pump of money from central banks. So in order to not repeat the mistakes of Japan, what do you think would be the optimal path for the Fed in terms of normalizing policy? I'm not saying this is what they are going to do, mm. but say you were at the helm, when yeah. do you think we should start to see tapering and higher rates? Oh, we should have seen it yesterday. Huh? <laughs> uh, if that makes any sense, you know. Obviously, I would have been I would have been dismissed very quickly. Because, <laughs> but um, we should have seen it already. <clears throat> the level of margin debt in the market, the level of uh, um, uh, net debt to EBITDA in corporations, the level of uh, borrowing from governments is clearly showing an overheated economy. Uh, raising rates 25 basis points is makes absolutely no change, but it sends a very important signal, which is that the solution to high debt is not more debt. No, and 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 basically, it also generates a positive incentive to the uh, virtuous cycle of credit. Right now, very low rates are not benefiting uh, real productive economic growth and real return in, uh, real economic return investments what it's doing basically is inflate already existing bubbles so the fact that governments are going to continue to finance themselves at negative real or nominal yields does not do anything when the when that excess liquidity is not going to the small businesses, families that actually might invest in something that is productive. No? So I think that they, they should be on a tailor based, uh, on a tailor rule, you know, the tailor rule by, the, by which you, they, uh, with inf they should be starting to send signals and put a, a, a calendar of raising rates, you know, moderately. And one thing that they absolutely should be doing right now is cutting the repurchase of assets at least by half because there's absolutely no need i mean look at the look at the bid to cover of us treasuries it's it's almost uh, is is higher than two times no why do you need to repurchase those assets there's massive demand ample demand globally for sovereign bonds now precisely that the recovery is something that that bond investors can actually bank on as as a sort of a solvency a solvency improvement all right daniel it's been so great to chat to you thank you so much for all your insights that was super interesting thank you so much always a pleasure and thank you for listening to this episode of IG's Trading the Markets podcast. That was Daniela Kalhi, the Chief Economist at Tresis. I'm Victoria Scholar, and thank you so much for listening. And if you did enjoy today's episode, don't forget to subscribe. For more videos like these, make sure to follow us on Twitter. We're at IGcom, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, IG UK.